What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? Welcome to another Rad Formational video here on this Monday. So, I had a comment last week asking me about the different ports in a rotary, but also not so much like explaining which one's better or which one's worse or whatever exactly, but more so like just kind of explaining the ramifications that come and the changes that come with porting your engine, but also. The topic that I think will address that is talking about rotary engine port timing, okay? So, what is port timing? We're going to start with going to the reference of a piston engine, okay? In a piston engine, the different cycles of the stroke, okay, so intake, compression, power, exhaust, right? Each one of those cycles happens and the intake or exhaust valve opens and closes so that you have what I would call in a piston engine very defined port timing right where it happens as a stated event in the timing circle so like as the engine rotates over the valve opens and closes right timing on a rotary because there is or there are no valves it's harder to grasp the concept of port timing right as the rotor sweeps the apex seal past the port, it's going to open the port for that cycle or side of the rotor. Then it's going to close the port as it keeps going, compress it, come around, and then as the next apex seal passes the exhaust port, it's going to open that up to help push it out. Right. So we're going to kind of talk about a little bit of that and then also how porting your engine affects this and then what those effects will have like on tuning it, on drivability, on stuff like that. Okay. So first things first, let's get a couple things in and out of the way. All right. Porting and in rotaries, the ports between different engines are different. Okay. So I have on the table here, this is a 12A iron, an early 12A. This is an R5 plate. Okay. This is an FD REW plate. Both of these are front irons. You're going to look at this front port and you're going to see that the 12A port right here is much smaller and the REW port is much bigger. Okay. So, what that does is the bigger port, right, is going to allow more air into the engine. Okay. You can increase the amount of air that comes in your engine without having a huge effect on the port timing okay so by doing that <coughs> you can pull the port up you can pull the port in a little bit that's going to increase the quantity of air right and that'll have a little bit of an effect on the drivability but it won't have as much of an effect on the drivability as pulling those ports in different directions to make them open sooner and, and later right so, and I guess what I'm getting out at the port timing thing too is, and if you've never watched one of these videos, it's kind of just like me talking about a topic and giving you the information. So I apologize if I'm a little jumpy around, but <clears throat> what I want to kind of equate a couple things to really quick while we're talking about the size and durations and the port, right? Making a port bigger on a rotary is essentially the same thing as like putting a bigger valve in a piston engine, but also on the same side, increasing the duration on that cam lobe, right? Because you let that valve open longer, therefore more air can come in, right? Or, and I say increasing the lift, but yes, increasing the lift would have the same effect. Now, changing the port timing, i.e. on a rotary, you know, like on a camshaft, you can move the cam lobe wherever you want when they make the camshaft, right? Or you can degree the cam. On a rotary, you can't. So in order to change the timing on this, what you would do is bring this port down, and that would open the port sooner. The port would be bigger, therefore having a longer duration, right? So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through this whole deal, okay? Another thing, another topic, let me just mention this before I go down the rabbit hole of talking about the different types of ports. Um, so now that you know that these two ports are different, right, the REW to the 12A, they're hugely, you know, vast, a bunch of room on the REW port, not a lot of room on a 12A port, you know, volumetrics are different there. The next thing I want to talk to you about is overlap, 
okay? Overlap happens in both piston engines and rotary engines. And what overlap is, is when the intake and exhaust ports are open at the same time. Okay, so in a piston engine, when the piston's starting to come up to evacuate all the air, the exhaust valve's already open. Before the piston reaches the top of its stroke, the intake valve's going to open. Therefore, it's going to push a little bit of air back out of that intake valve before the piston starts going down to suck it in, right? Now, in a rotary, how this works, and I've positioned this rotor right here in order to show you the exact situation, okay? In a rotary, how this works, you have intake air coming in the top, compressed down the side, and going out the bottom. Right here, when this is going to start to come around, you're going to see... As the exhaust is closing this port, or, or the exhaust is going out this port, okay, there would be an iron behind this, which let me grab, I'm about to flip this the other way, so you can see it, because I have front irons out. Sorry. Okay. This will help you guys kind of visualize this. Okay, so... We'll go through one full cycle. The intake port, right here, and this rotation is now open, right? Or well, I guess it got opened way back here, but the air goes around, gets compressed, we make fire happen, and right here, as you can see, the fire, okay, the fire has happened in the bottom, right? Compression, spark, fire, exhaust, this is all exhaust gas right now. It's going out the exhaust port right here, which just opened as this passed it, Okay. This section of the chamber is completely sealed, only this port's open. As this moves around, okay, like this, in the direction of rotation, you can see right now the exhaust gas is getting pushed out the exhaust, right? Out the exhaust this way. Once you get to, like, over here, they've designed this little lip to kind of keep that intake port closed while the exhaust is happening, but you're going to see right in there, right there now, right? This gap and this gap, you now have both ports open at the same time. This rotor does not touch right here, so this is a, a portion of the thing. And if you can imagine this is pushing pressure out of the exhaust, it hasn't yet started to create suction, or it's really close to starting to create suction, right, over that port. But there is going to be a weird imbalance happening here. So, the long story of overlap, right? Now, to sum it up, when you port your rotary... Okay, and I'm going to grab an iron that's heavily ported here in a second. When you port your rotary, and if you keep in mind port timing like I explained earlier, most street port rotaries, the typical non-aggressive ones, and by non-aggressive I mean like non-aggressive sounding, okay, so you don't have those braps, you still get a nice smooth idle, right, and this is going to be why. Most of the non-aggressive, pretty basic street ports are going to be just kind of up here, right? You're going to do this number and tie that back in. Now, now that you know what port timing is, what is this doing to affect that port timing? Does this port increase overlap? The answer is going to be no, right? You might have a little bit of more volume coming in up here, you know, as the rotor comes across it. You might get a little bit more because it's opening up a little bit. But if you don't pull this port back and you don't pull this port down, you're not going to increase the overlap. Overlap, like I said, jump around a little bit. Overlap is what causes that gnarly brap that full bridge port, peripheral port motors have. Okay, And what is actually causing the brap or how the brap happens is that when the exhaust gas is getting pushed out, into the intake port, right? Because both are open at the same time. What's that? What that's doing is creating a pressure that fights your engine vacuum, right? Now you're pushing air out the intake, okay? So the engine's going to be like hiccuping, right? It's going to be like... Whoosh. Then once the, the exhaust valve is closed or exhaust port is closed, the engine now is transitioning into a vacuum, right? which is going to suck air in. So you get this, like, uh, what do you call it, like a balloon or a, um, a push, like an inflatable bag effect, right, where you get that, 
where the intake is breathing out and then in, out and then in, out and then in. And that is what's making that brap happen. That's where it's like brap, 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 brap. It's because when it hits the brap part and, and surges up is whenever it closes that exhaust port and sucks the air in. And then whenever it kind of dies off, that's whenever it's pushing air out the intake and it's not coming in, right? So just kind of understand, like, that's why that happens, okay? So, back to the street port. The street port doesn't increase that, doesn't increase the overlap, doesn't open the port sooner, so you don't have that gnarly brap. You get a little bit of the brap from having a larger duration, larger quantity of air now because that port's bigger. Um, and that's going to give you a little bit of a surge just because, you know, it's going to be more air coming in at once, right? But you won't have that, like, gnarly, you know, bridge port wrap. Now, let's add more ports to this port, okay? So, what could be called a race port, what could be called a lot of, like, people do without doing a full bridge or anything, is you'll see a lot of people that'll pull this port down this way. You'll see a lot of people that'll bring this port. Why am I doing this in the same color? Come on, dude. We'll keep our color codes here. Alright, so you'll see more people too that'll pull this down this way. I know the racing beat template um, that I'll show you here in a second for a full bridge pulls the port down. You've got more that can do more duration this way. You can bring it out further this way and taper it back in. And all of that porting limitations, right? Those different changes you make, okay, are going to accentuate either the overlap, the duration is going to make an inconsistent vacuum, and that's going to make engines and or the inconsistent vacuum is going to make a tuner's job harder or make getting your carburetor dialed in harder, right? Harder to tune transit, anyways, those things. So these ports, the more you port it, the more adverse effects you have on that overlap, and your port timing has effects on the overlap and everything like that, right? Where you now have this thing fighting itself okay so to now draw in a bridge port I'm gonna have to erase my lovely label here but you can see here how a bridge port's gonna madly increase the overlap because this bridge is gonna go back here right and you're gonna have this chilling so now this big area which is essentially in this area of the engine right right here where this is open your bridge is going to sit right in there. Apologize that this doesn't stay. But it's going to sit back in here against the back of the iron or the back of the housing, and that's where that overlap is going to be at. So this is going to pull in a bunch more air. The quantity is greater. The overlap is greater, which means you have braps, and braps are epic. That's why rotaries are cool, besides being smooth and all of that. So... That's kind of the general premise of the port timing, the ports, the, the overlap, the this, that, and the other. So, now I'm going to show you a couple examples. I'm going to show you a couple different irons to uh, like for you guys to be able to compare the ports. So, if you have a 6 port, if you have a 4 port, if you have a 12A, I'll kind of explain to you how some of those work. REW, I don't have any RX-8 irons here. I'm sorry, but the concept is the exact same, and RX-8s actually have a pretty big pretty big port okay so if you go on the internet and you want to try to learn more about the the more specific stuff of like port timing camshaft stuff like that go learn about piston engine camshafts and how the lobes are made and how they they choose where they go because that's the concept is pretty much the same right okay so talking about ports and stuff okay and we can kind of talk about the drivability of each different one and a little a little bit later in the video but let's just compare port sizes right we're guys we like to compare things so rew port like i showed you earlier 12a port like i also showed you earlier you can see here the 12a port much smaller the 12a port opens later the 12a port closes sooner right super smooth also super smooth but different new style old style carburetor stuff right now let's introduce to the mix actually let me just grab a six port real quick to show you that if i can unearth one that's not i need i need that one but i think i have a six port rear okay that's gonna be way harder to get out 
So I try to film these on a one take because it makes me not have to stay up super late editing these. But anyways, I'll show you this one and then I'll show you a six port here in a second. So bear with me for like 22 seconds and watch me struggle to get this out of here. If you can even see it. Rotors, I should have got this out before the, the beginning. But you're going to see as well, and I think the guy's question was more so phrased around that. He had a tuner or an engine builder that didn't want to do a certain port that he wanted because the drivability would suck and it is what it is in some cases. Alright, so we'll move the bad mamma jamma full bridge port one out of the way here. Too bad. You gotta shoot them down. We'll line these up so you can see kind of all these ports in a line and you can see the different uh the different species here. All right, this will work. This will work. Apologize for the delay. Okay, so now we have three of the typical style of ports chilling in a row. And I'll say typical style because your old school 13Bs, four port 13Bs, right, and your turbo stuff is going to be more so similar to this 12A plate for the old school stuff, and turbo will be somewhat similar to this REW plate as far as the port size comparatively to these in these three. This is a six port iron, okay? This top one would have a sleeve, that's your auxiliary ports. I don't really have a video on that, but you can read up on those to, to kind of learn more about how that works and comes on to the top. We'll kind of explain it a little bit here too. So, looking at this picture, or this image, if I hold a picture, image, right, same thing. The video you're watching, if I hold this level, use this hole right here as a reference to kind of give you that port timing and feel of size, right? So, the bolt pattern around these is all the same. You can see the 12A port, right? Opening late. REW port opening sooner. This is unported, by the way. Six port opening about the same time as the REW port, but notice the duration, how much bigger this is, right? This is your actual fourth port that would match what that one functions as, but the six port, huge. And you'll have guys that run six port engines without the sleeves, which means that. Essentially, this is now your secondary port, whereas if you would put that size on there, right? Bigger. So, the big mamma jamma. The path, or the bridge. Okay. This is a full bridge port R5 plate, okay? The R5 plate's the early 12A plate. It's basically... If we take this one right here, this got turned into that. Okay, they're not the exact same, but they're affectionately the same. So <coughs> you can see here, tiny, whatever. This one, they brought that down, right? Brought that port down, increased, or I guess advanced the port timing. Open it up sooner. You can see the bridge here, right? Now you have all this extra space for overlap to happen whenever the rotor is sitting there. You're going to get that pushing of air back into the intake before it sucks it back in. You can also see here that they've pulled the port up, increasing the duration, okay, which is going to allow the quantity of air to be greater, right? So I hope that gives you kind of a understanding of what the different ports look like next to each other as well as just kind of the port time and the overlap, the different effects, and you can kind of problem solve in your head and dream up your own custom ports, right? So, let's talk drivability now, all right? With, and, and the drivability, I'll, dang it, being dumb. I'll link, go check out the drive, I made a video about asking if my Bridgeport RX-7 is treatable, and it popped off. Super awesome video, very successful. It did make, like, you know, it did really well, okay? I mean, like, maybe 50 bucks on that one versus the 10 I would make on these. But that's neither here nor there. The biggest point of these videos is for you guys to learn. So, streetability between this, comparing a rotary to a piston engine, is basically, you can do that, okay? A big cam, an aggressive cam piston engine is going to drive much like a really aggressive ported rotary, okay? And with that comes, when you have an idle or an inconsistent vacuum, don't expect your engine to run smooth, right, until you've stabilized 
the airflow. Okay, so for example, on my Bridgeport car, the engine's probably not seeing a super consistent vacuum or airflow, right, at throttle positions less than 10% throttle at any RPM, and then also at any RPM below like 15 or 1600, right? So at part throttle at 2200 RPM, it's going to just kind of buck, right? That is what it is. It's going to surge and do its thing. So ways to kind of take advantage of porting and mitigate that bucking are doing like what I showed here. Do a small street port. Do, you know, maybe a bigger street port if you're okay to tolerate a little bit of it, but you don't want it to like buck you out the windshield. You know, different things like that. Now, we'll kind of step into the half bridge ports or the half whatever ports, okay? So in a rotary, you have... A center iron with primary ports, your outer irons are your secondary ports. What that means is that as you use your throttle pedal, the primary ports are what are opened with, say, your first quarter to half of pushing the pedal down. Okay? So I have this intake right here. This top port is a primary port you'll see it's going to open first. If this isn't seized up, picked a great... Okay, so see, the top port is opening first. I hope this focuses. I guess I could get this out and put it in the light for you. Please don't fall off. Man, I thought I was prepared for this video. I really wasn't. All right, so uh, hopefully you can see up in there. Notice I'm just barely working the throttle. You can see the primary port working. Now... The reason it's separated like that in primaries and secondaries is because at part throttle, they want to try to give you a low volume of air in order to stabilize the vacuum, stabilize the engine's intake, so that it doesn't buck and kick, right? So that's why, like an FD, can have these huge secondary ports, but when you're driving around, the drivability, right, only is affected on the primaries. So, a very common engine build, and I've put two of them in, is what would be called a half bridge port, okay? And when you do a full bridge port, versus a half bridge port, a full bridge port means you bridge port every single port. You bridge port the primary ports in here, you bridge port the secondary ports. A half bridge port means you only bridge port the secondary ports. And you can do just like a mild street port on the primary ports. And what that does, is gives you the drivability down low with the top end, okay? And most of the time, too, your drivability on a stock intake setup will be pretty good if you just have a decent street port and then you do that half bridge port stuff, right? The braps that you hear, you can get a decent amount of brap out of a pretty decent, pretty sized, pretty good sized street port on the primary ports, right? And have you set up your intake. Now, so that kind of that kind of goes through primaries and secondaries, half bridge port. If you street port all of them, obviously, you know, no big deal. Now, we're going to switch gears from kind of talking in generics that will apply to all rotaries to now. Well, I guess uh, this is still apply to all rotaries. Okay, so if you switch to an intake setup, that no longer has primaries and secondaries, you have now created an intake port that is the size of all the ports together. Does that make sense? So if you have no way to separate these secondary big ports right here, right? If you have no way to se separate these, you now have this much air, the cumulative amount, going into your engine. So, for example, if you switch your carburetor from a Nikki carburetor or a Holly carburetor or whatever to a Weber. Okay, a Weber carburetor does not have primaries and secondaries. A Weber carburetor only has two barrels. The one barrel feeds the front rotor, the other barrel feeds the rear rotor. That means that you have a bunch of air coming into your engine not very well regulated. So your drivability on a Weber is generally not going to be that good for low speed stuff but everyone's going to tell you a Weber is going to scream 
to the moon on RPM, right? And that's why I have a Weber on my car, got a Weber on my truck. And they're kind of a pain to, to drive around. I mean, even my truck, which is just a street port 13B, still bucks and kicks. And it's just because it has that, that side draft on it, right? So if I go and on my old 12A setup in the silver car, I had a Holly. On a Holly manifold, all the primaries and secondaries are separated, which means you can do a half bridge port, like I said, and you can get decent drivability on the bottom end. Okay. So, like I've done on those the FDs and the whatever, that half bridge port should be about the same as like I've explained. That's just doing a street port. Okay. And yes, there is still going to be airflow that's going to come past the secondaries. Yes, you are increasing the overall volume. And yes, you will see like a pretty gnarly idle. You know, doing a half bridge port is definitely still going to be overall more aggressive than just a street port, right? But trying to keep some separation in your port size primary to secondary is going to help out that drivability because that's going to make that transition, you know, easier, right? So, I don't know. I don't know if that made any sense for you guys. I guess let me give you one case study example of a port that I came up with. That's I that I ran in my FC RX7. It's a Series 5 NA, so it's a six port engine. So what I did on that six porter, I guess this is before I knew how to build engines, but I knew what porting was and I understand it I understand it understood this concept. So when I had my engine built, this is what I wanted done to it, right? So I approached the engine builder and said, Can we do just a street port on the lower port here we'll do just a street port on the center iron okay and then what I had him do is cut a bridge and bridge port the auxiliary ports so by doing that the fifth and sixth ports on a six port engine I had all the emissions on it everything full blown seven feet of vacuum line in this thing making everything work freshen it all up okay the Auxiliary ports are closed until like 5,000 RPM, we'll say. When you fire up, or would, when I would fire up that car, it would idle dead smooth, right? No braps, no nothing, dead smooth. When you would drive it, drivability was awesome. Didn't buck, didn't do anything. When you cracked that throttle open and got into the six ports, man, that thing came on super strong. It made... Like 170 something wheel horsepower on whatever dyno we were on. Ernie will know. I think the dyno was reading low because that car would keep up with and smoke an RX8. And, you know, yeah, power to weight, whatever, whatever. But RX8s are pretty quick compared to an FC. So that thing, it ripped. It would do a second, it would spin the tires into second gear. And if you really banged third hard enough and it was maybe a little bit wet, you could spin the tire into third just a little bit. But that car ripped. And it loved the top end. So that's where like you can tune in or dial in that that balance, right? Now, another port that I did for a friend of mine locally, and I'll try to get it out here and show you a little bit of it if I can. I don't want to pull the whole iron out. Is what I would call like a mini bridge, like a half bridge mini bridge, okay? So it was a half bridge port, i.e. it was only bridged on the secondaries, but I did a really small one, right? So super small just like this barely didn't increase the the port time didn't bring it down any just kind of left it all in that top end section right and what that did is it, it gave that car a nice choppy you know 15 1400 rpm idle the drivability super nice you know it's a turbo car so you don't need a huge port right you can make up for volumetric efficiency or you can make volumetric efficiency up with a bigger turbo right if you don't have big ports, put more air in it, right? Because that's essentially what you're doing with the port. But anyways, that car, which there's a video on it on the channel, S5 right-hand drive turbo 2. It has a big, huge wing on the back. It was probably a couple years ago. That car is a, is a blast drive. It's super comfy, super safe, and I say safe, super fun and to drive around and this, that, and the other. And, and it's just like when you pull up to a stoplight, no, it doesn't brap and doesn't shake like the silver car, right? Or my, the mouse, which is now the 99 car. Um, but it doesn't shake the whole car and go crazy and do whatever, whatever, right? It just has this nice little bup, 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 
where like the silver car is like bop, 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 the whole car is going crazy, you know. Um, but it, it gives you that, hey, when you pull up next to a cammed out Mustang, you got a little bit of throat to to put in that fight to, to put on, you know, you have a little more of a stoplight presence, right? So that's kind of my, uh, my science lesson on porting the effects, how it drives. Um, I am not going to tell you what port I think is best. I, I think that you need to decide what port you want for your situation, right? And I guess I'll say uh, I'll say this, kind of contradicting what I just said about my what port is best, but there is no do all port, right? And if you want a car that makes a ton of power, or makes that gnarly noise, or makes that whatever, or if you want a car that's smooth, or you want whatever, you're gonna have to make sacrifices, okay? Especially with these. In a piston engine, you can you can dial in the cam timing a lot better, and you can have a lot more control over it, so you can. You can really be precise, and, and you can know exactly what you want. And in these, you can do some more things, but there's a little more ability to be precise there, right? Now, what was I saying? There's no port that does everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so in a rotary, when you're trying to build your car for whatever purpose you decide to build your car, that's where you get to decide what port you think best suits you, right? Track car, full rip track car. If you're not going to try to drive it on the street, then why not do a big port, right? Why not? It's going to sound sick when you're cruising through the paddock. The thing's going to rip on the top end. You know, you're going to spend all your time above 6,000 RPM anyways. You're not even going to use when I mean, you're using the primary ports, but you're not like, that's not what you need them there for, you know, to full bridge that thing. That's what the 12A car that I have has, which is asinine to put that car on the street. But, you know, I don't know. That's, I wanted that. It's kind of loud and obnoxious to drive and shakes. <coughs> <clears throat> and does whatever but like that's what i wanted if i wanted a smooth one right if i wanted it to be dead quiet dead smooth dead whatever i'd build a car like sheba the white car out here which is a bone stock turbo 2 no porting no nothing with a little small turbo they make the same horsepower they're both about the same fun to drive but the white turbo 2 powered version you can come up to a stoplight the thing just purrs no shake, no nothing, it's quiet, it's whatever. But it's going to keep up with that full Bridgeport car sitting right next to you that's waking everybody up in a two-mile radius, right? So finding that balance, like the middle ground, which I really don't have anything in the middle ground. I guess you could say my rotary truck is, but it's a street ported 13B, and it kind of is the middle ground. It has a little bit of a brat, but not, not like gnarly of a brat. And, you know, it rips. <coughs> but that truck doesn't pull as hard as the other one. So you're sacrificing power. For smoothness, right? And that's the ultimate debate, right? Power versus drivability. Most cars that make a ton of power aren't the most drivable things, especially when you're talking in like this realm of budget or, you know, the only real cars that do do that are like exotics. Crazy boosted stuff, you can make tons of power, but you still have to have the, the supporting stuff to do it, I guess. So, anyways, I'm going to quit rambling. I'm going to go inside. It's been a super long weekend. Tune in to tomorrow's video to see Justin and I. He came down this past weekend, and we rehomed everything from the silver car, which is now becoming a, uh, not really a parts car, but a momentous, because that's the car that created all of this for me. So I'm going to kind of build a little landscaping thing around it in one of my mountain bike jumps and make a mountain bike jump over it. Uh, but I'm taking all the good parts off of it, don't worry. They're, it's helping out so many other cars. I rehomed all of that into my 99 GSLSE. So I have the most on GSLSE, GSLSE times two. The rally car, which doesn't have a sunroof. This was a GSLSE, no sunroof, crank windows, no wiper, no whatever. And now my other GSL street, GSLSE street streetcar has 4x110 brakes and all sorts of the SA stuff. So go check out that video. It'll be up after this one. And then also, go check out the other videos on the channel, guys. If you guys are, have came here, it's your first time, this, you want to learn about rotaries, I have tons of great rad formational videos on the channel to help you guys learn. The whole goal of this channel is to provide you guys with information. I generally don't vlog, per se. All of my videos are going to teach you something, okay? I want you to learn. So yes, I may work on my car and progress it further in the video, but the purpose of me videoing that is to try to teach you something, give you the experience I have, let you learn from my mistakes, our mistakes, 
make a mistake, comment below, tell me what what you've learned, and uh, to to grow this this lovely community. So, drop a comment below if you have any questions on any of this. I will do my best to answer them. Also, drop a comment below if you can teach me something or if I said something wrong. I'm not perfect. I'm also not an expert on this stuff. I know a bunch about it, but I'm definitely not an expert, and I definitely know there's more to know. So, with that, guys, thank you very much for watching the entirety of the video. It would be awesome if you guys subscribe to the channel. Have a wonderful night. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Keep it rad. Are you chasing moss? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? You're learning about rotaries, right? This is like learning by osmosis. See her? She loves it. Staring down the rotaries. Staring down the rotaries. What are you doing? What is it? Alright guys, peace.